uh, Dwight Mahalitz, I'm chair of ICMCI. Welcome all. Uh, the waiting room is just now emptying and our participants are coming on board. So I thought I would give a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, welcome to this ongoing series. We're just delighted that uh, management consultants from around the world can, can come together and, and share information and experiences. And in our online seminar series, we do have some sessions where we bring in experts uh, that can give us information from their perspective that we can then uh, follow up on and, uh, and learn from. Uh, so I'm just delighted that we have uh, Dave Copps uh, with us today. Uh, he's the CEO of um, Worlds. It's an organization that uh, focuses in on machine learning and AI. I met Dave in Dallas last uh, October uh, at the IMC USA conference. Uh, if you remember back in those days when we had live people talking to us and we were all in the same room, <laughs> those were the fun days. Um, so anyway, it, uh, yeah, I was just totally amazed by his enthusiasm and his depth of knowledge in this field. So I asked if he would join us today and he, I'm, I'm just delighted that he has agreed to do that. Uh, Dave describes himself as a serial entrepreneur, a technologist, and a startup guy focused on the role that machine learning and AI will bring to and transform the way organizations uh, operate. So I'm, I'm just uh, absolutely delighted, Dave, to hear uh, what you have to say. Um, just two quick notes. Uh, we will have a question and answer period at the end, so please use the chat box and put questions in the chat box as you're going through. I'll monitor that and then I'll manage the questions. Uh, we're very well attended today, so we won't be able to, um, to open all of the um, uh, microphones for people, but I'll, I'll manage questions on your behalf. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be available on the ICMCI YouTube channel. And Dave has kindly agreed to give us a PDF of these slides. So you don't have to take notes. You'll uh, be getting a copy of those uh, in due course. So uh, may I suggest we, uh, those of us who aren't speaking, uh, and in other words, everyone but Dave, let's turn our, micro uh, our uh, video feeds off uh, so we can focus in on Dave and then uh, we can all open our cameras at the end for the open discussion. So Dave, you've been muted by the system, so we'll have to get you to unmute and uh, I'll turn it over to you at this moment. There you go. All right, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Great, okay. Thanks everybody, great to be with you this morning. Um, boy, it's a, a crazy time in our world, uh, but I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to be with you today. Um, uh, this, I'll try to talk for about 35 minutes or so, and, and uh, maybe hope to leave plenty of time for questions. I think, especially on these Zoom conferences, I've, I actually really like being in person. You know, when I'm uh, speaking at a live event, I can see people's faces and, and, uh, and react, you know, I get more energy from that. So I, I tend to go faster on these uh, Zoom calls, but uh, I'll try to kind of keep it at a pace. Uh, but uh, yeah, please feel free to uh, write down some questions and let's make it a very uh, dynamic conversation at the end. Uh, uh, but thanks for having me today. Um, so, you know, when I started, uh, signed up to do this talk, it was really before the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, and so the last several, a couple of months here, it's been a strange time, it seems like it's a strange time to talk about abundance. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the more I thought about it, uh, the more I realized it's, it's really not. Um, uh, the tools, the technology, the mindsets that were powering the pre-COVID kind of abundance have not changed. Uh, they're still there. And so... Um, they're also the same technologies that will, that will get us out of this mess, you know. So I think it's a the talk, talk like this is actually maybe even more relevant than it was, you know, several weeks ago. Um, it's not hard to watch the news and, and uh, to adopt a dystopian view <laughs> of AI and other exponential technologies. Uh, but uh, I think uh, you know, I think people talk about is the future of the, US, the future about us or is it about AI? And uh, I don't think that's kind of a false false question. I think that it's not about us or the technology that's a false choice. Uh, there's no reason we can't have both. You know, uh, Let's talk about that. Uh, people being powered by AI and solving problems in ways and in, at a scale and at a, uh, accelerate a pace that we've never had before. So, um, so I'm a, yeah, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've built and sold uh, two companies. I'm my third company now. Uh, all my companies have been focused on AI and machine learning. I uh, put literally uh, hundreds of companies uh, uh, AI into hundreds of companies around the world uh, through my companies. Uh, I'm currently CEO of a company called Worlds. Uh, we're a spatial AI company. So my last two companies are really focused on uh, human language. We are understanding how to capture human language on a massive scale to read 100, building a machine and AI that could uh, consume 100 million documents and start to understand what's being said in all the documents and build a brain on that and use that brain to 
find uh, and, and uh, other other things and people. Uh, this time, we're really focused on the, the, the physical world, bringing AI into the physical world. So with uh, worlds, what we're doing is we're capturing environments with cameras and other sensors in, in 2D. And we're in almost real time, about five seconds, we're recreating that environment inside of a 3D model, 4D model, because we're including time. So it's almost like turning real life into a video game. When we capture in 2D, we re-express in a 3D model uh, in a five second delay. So now everything is measurable in space and time. And so there's lots of crazy use cases for that and more around security and safety and uh, improving operations inside businesses. Um, I, I love what I do. Uh, I'm, I'm not just a student of AI, I do I teach and I've got a, I'm a practitioner. Uh, so I, I love AI. Uh, of my, like, it's not only my profession, it's really kind of a passion of mine. I, I think the potential for AI to change the world is, is, uh, is amazing. Uh, and we're learning more and more every day. We're seeing it, uh, how it can be really uh, be at the core of everything we're doing. And uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm fascinated by that and uh, uh, lucky to be kind of working in that area. Um, yeah, I, I do start companies. I try to work with other companies. My wife says I'm genetically unemployable. I think she's right. Uh, I just, I'm not very good at working for other people, so I tend to start companies. Um, so before we look forward, why don't we look back a little bit? So uh, 100 years ago, uh, let's just say six earth shattering innovations were shaking the world. <laughs> um, so the first of those, in most, a little 101 years ago, in 1919, we had the silicon gel pack. Big innovation. Now things could, uh, could uh, not, not be too moist in that package. The toaster, another one. <laughs> and then uh, 2020, we had uh, breakthroughs in transportation and healthcare and consumer electronics and communications. In transportation, we had the stoplight. <laughs> and in uh, healthcare, we had the band aid. In consumer electronics, we had the blow dryer. And uh, communications, we had a first radio station. Uh, <laughs> so when you look at these slides, this slide, you, what you really start to get present to is that uh, you get a feel for how we're redefining acceleration, you know, and uh, the, the change is happening, the pace of the change is happening. Um, if you compare that to 2020, just this year, uh, you know, we're living in a time so. That's uh, amazing. A drug designed entirely by artificial intelligence, AI, entered clinical trials uh, last year. Uh, and, and the trial happened in 12 months. I mean, the, the drug development happened in 12 months, not, not five years or 10 years or 15 years. Um, prime editing, so inside CRISPR, you know, we're actually now to, it would be so precise that we can actually get the potential to cure 89% of all genetic diseases. Um, first flying car went public on NASDAQ. Uh, Tesla drove 2 billion miles on autopilot. Uh, SpaceX will have 20 launches this year, uh, putting 1,000 satellites in orbit. Um, and BCI, brain computer interface, you know, something we, sounds a little scary, but uh, Neuralink uh, has placed 10 chips in the brains of uh, mammals. Uh, so we're already starting to uh, take that distance that we've had between our devices and certain shorten it to actually become uh, implantable. He actually thinks he's going to be putting uh, the first BCI brain computer interface in a human next year. Uh, so um, it sounds scary because I think we all think about the usage of that's going to be for, you know, to make people smarter, faster, things like that. Really the initial focus of Neuralink is going to be to help people who have been uh, crippled walk again uh, and to help people who are blind see again, things like that. So uh, the prospects are, are amazing. Uh, and then the Sycamore processor, which for qubits perform a calculation in 200 seconds that would have taken a classical computer 10,000 years. So the pace of innovation is, is unbelievable today. Um, some of the things that we're seeing because of that, child mortality rates have gone down to literally nothing. Uh, renewable energy, 10x solar capacity. Um, and now for the first time in the world, more than 50% of the, the world is using the internet. Um, this is an amazing thing. When you start to bring everyone in the world and put them online and connect them with each other. It's a whole other level of exponential growth that we're going to, we're going to witness as we start to uh, have billions of people connected around the world. So all of this affects, and this is pre-COVID, of course, but, <laughs> but the world GDP was 30%, 33% higher over the last decade. The last 10 years is 33% higher than the global GDP. Um, and I do think, as I said before, I think AI is going to be the thing that takes, takes us back out of this mess. Um, we'll, we'll be able to accelerate and do things faster and easier and uh, more automated than we ever were before. Um, so when I talk about artificial intelligence, you know, I, I used to kind of say that the AI is the science of teaching machines to think and learn like we do. Um, I don't say that anymore. I think the more I've learned about AI, uh, now I kind of say something different. I basically say AI is the science of teaching machines 
to think like a new species with a radically evolved thinking capabilities that learns nothing like we do. Um, so I think at this point, we can say it's a comfortable myth that we're living with that, mach that machines think like we do. Uh, the deeper we're going into machine learning and AI, the more we're realizing that this is not just, it's not gonna be true. Uh, we're learning that AI today in very narrow tasks, and narrow, narrow tasks can perform at a level that's not possible for human beings. Um, you think about uh, the story of Google Translate, you know, it's just, uh, I was backstage at an event uh, with one of the guys that uh, was a, a, a inventors of Google Translate, they were talking about, and they switched that system from a human curated system to a system that was curated by AI, deep learning. And um, the Google Translate uh, ingested 15 years of uh, human curation in 48 hours. So in 48 hours, it learned 15 years of what we've been teaching for people in, in 48 hours. Um, so this acceleration of AI is exciting. And if you, I don't know if you use Google Translate, but it's gotten, you can see that the, it's gotten so much better. Uh, and that's all because of deep learning. Now that we have a system that can learn by example, as opposed to us coding in what it should learn. Um, so we're still not at a point where machines can grasp cause and effect. Um, but given a specific task, it's clear that machines will learn better, faster, and at a scale that's not, that we can't imagine. And this is causing really an unprecedented acceleration. So I think in the next 10 years, um, we'll see uh, more advancement uh, than we've seen in the last 100 years. And maybe more importantly, um, the way that we work will change more than it has in the last 2,000 years as we start to augment ourselves with AI and as AI becomes a part of literally everything we do. Um, yeah, it's funny, um, I tell people that um, one way to tell when AI is being successful is that it disappears. You know, technology uh, has always been kind of uh, in front of us and, and you have to push buttons to make things happen. But um, when AI is successful, it disappears. You don't see it, things just happen. Uh, the world becomes more automagical. And um, that's, uh, that's what we're heading for. Um, so why is all this happening now? Well, um, after two AI winners, um, the pieces are now in place uh, for us to have a persistent acceleration uh, for humanity. <laughs> um, you know, AI really has been around for a long time. You think about it in the 1960s, right? So in the, in the 60s, uh, we had a lot of promise uh, and there was a, a dip, you know, that uh, the promise exceeded the, what was actually delivered with AI. And that happened again. And so there's been what we call AI winters, these things that um, were, we say, hey, it sounded great, but it's not really there's, it's, it's not working. Um, we won't have any more AI winters. Um, there are three things that are coming together today that are going to create a persistent acceleration of AI, unlike anything we've seen before. And the convergence of these things will actually change virtually every part of our lives and every industry in the, on the planet. So one of those things is accelerated hardware. Um, so we'll talk about that in a second here. The second is massive amounts of data. You know, data used to almost be a liability, right? We couldn't store it, we had to work on it. You don't hear about people saying, I can't store the data anymore. Remember that used to be the biggest issue, where do I store this data? You don't even hear anybody say it anymore. Uh, we can store the data, but not only can we store it, we can actually transform it, and that's with software. So these three things are coming together uh, to create an abundance and acceleration uh, in society and the world that we've never seen before. Um, so let's start with, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, the, the hardware piece of that. So as, as we're co-evolving with technology, we're learning that um, while we can't bend time, um, we can actually exponentially decrease what's possible in time. Um, what I mean by that is let's look at the processors. So hardware has changed dramatically in the 80s. It was 50,000 uh, transistors on a chip. Now we're at 32 billion transistors on a chip. And I actually think it's more than this now. I think this is a slide that needs to be updated. Um, but more importantly, uh, what does that mean? Uh, what that means is that uh, we've gone from calculations per, per second from 50,000 to 200 quadrillion calculations per second. Think about that. What's possible now today that wasn't possible before now that we can do 200 quadrillion calculations per second. So we're not, we're not changing time, but we are bending it. <laughs> we are, we are, we are, are we're, we're making possible what's possible in time. To put this in kind of perspective, just a kind of a human perspective, um, the summit computer at the DOE, if every person on earth, if every person on earth performed one calculation per second, every second of the day, it would take us almost a year to do what the DOE supercomputer can do in one second, uh, just to kind of put it in perspective. 
So again, the capabilities that are coming today because of hardware, they're possible because of hardware. Things are changing dramatically. I'm, uh, one of the joys of my job is I get to interact with people that are building new technologies. And now we have uh, companies that are building uh, better and better AI chips. Now AI chips is a thing, you know, it's not just CPUs, now it's GPUs and going beyond GPUs and creating uh, AI chips, you know, so uh, tensor processors and a new company called Brock and things like that. So, um, but, uh, all this, uh, so let's talk about data. So data is everywhere, right? And um, we all know now that it's the most valuable natural occurring resource in the world, right? It's data. Uh, it's not oil, it's not diamonds. Uh, if you have a barrel of oil and you have another barrel of oil, you have two barrels of oil. Um, it's not exponential. Uh, data carries with it a really unique property that's not shared by all the other uh, assets. And that is that the value of data increases exponentially when you start to connect it with other tech, with other tech, with technology. Um, and AI, when you start to layer AI on top of data, we're now getting into the area of data transformation where it's not about taking data set A and data set B and, and mashing them together to do something. It's now taking these data sets, multiple data sets, combining them together to create a new data set, a transformed data set, new information that did not exist before. Now that we're able to calculate that data in ways that weren't possible before. We can start to surface patterns and events or, or patterns of, uh, that, that we could never see before um, because AI is, uh, has this ability to kind of look very broadly. You know, so when you think about uh, when a person reads a book, uh, we read it one page at a time. Uh, if uh, the analogy of AI were to read a book, it spreads all the pages out front and back and reads them all simultaneously. When you're able to have that kind of breadth of, uh, of uh, a view, uh, you start to surface and see patterns that you can't see if you look at things myopically or serially. So it's really important for us to, to start to, to keep interacting with AI. Um, and we're really just at the tip of the iceberg with data. Now with IoT, um, we're approaching what we're all now calling, calling the fourth uh, industrial revolution. Um, but today we have over 25 billion connected devices, phones, computers, light bulbs, televisions, watches, everything. Uh, every household has 20 to 30 connected devices. Um, so by 2025, we'll have 100 billion connected devices. And we'll be living basically in a trillion sensor economy. So producing more data than we have in the last 5,000 years. Um, so with sensors around us, the environments we're in will actually become smart. The, our environments themselves will actually become intelligent and resourceful. Uh, watching out for us and meeting our needs before maybe we, we know we have them. Um, an interesting part of this revolution too uh, is the emergence of continuous, low power, always on sensors, you know, processing cores. Uh, your mobile phone is always on. It's always, always imaging, always locating you. Um, the volume of sensor manufacturing has driven down the cost of sensors incredibly. Uh, so the first uh, GPS unit was $120,000. That cost of a GPS chip in a phone today is a, maybe a buck, you know, a dollar. Uh, the sensors in your phone were uh, millions of dollars, you know, uh, but now they're pennies, literally pennies. The, you have multiple sensors in your phone that used to cost millions of dollars are now, you know, maybe 10 bucks. <laughs> um, and then we ourselves are sensors, you know, so if you think about this, um, with AI, the mobile internet now becomes sensor net. Uh, so we're all carrying five to 15 sensors on our bodies if you have uh, like an Apple watch and a phone uh, or digital watch and a phone. Um, we're now capturing your heart rate, your gait, how you walk, your phones are capturing location, where you are, when, what you buy, who you're hanging out with. Billions of people are being sensed and being, uh, are billions of people sensing and billions are being sensed, creating an awareness um, and predictability of our world that was really never possible before. Um, so data is amazing. Uh, we can now not just store it, but we can actually transform it and do things with it never possible. Um, so what about software? So, um, from a software point of view, uh, <clears throat> if you look back, there was a Bernie the Brain that could do, beat any human at tic-tac-toe. as a huge breakthrough, like 255,168 possible moves. Uh, but then we all remember Big Blue beat Gary Kasparov at chess, 121 million possible moves. I think uh, more recently, last couple of years, that uh, was with uh, Google's AlphaGo. Uh, you know, so in seven hours of self-play, it surpassed 1,500 years of human learning. And to put, alpha, uh, to put the game Go into perspective, there are 10 to the 17th power moves, possible moves in Go. That is, there are more moves and possible moves in Go than there are atoms in the known universe, to give you an idea of the complexity of that game. So 
uh, you know, uh, AlphaGo incorporated a technique we're calling reinfor reinforcement learning, and it's a huge breakthrough. Uh, the system learned without any prior data set. You know, so it played itself in a game for 1,200 times as fast as it, in an accelerated pace and learned along the way. So if you remember the, the movie War Games, this is a long time ago with Matthew Broderick, you all remember that, that movie? Um, you know, there's a point in the movie where I think the uh, supercomputer was called Whopper, W-O-P-R, and um, Whopper was playing itself in thermonuclear war, a game of thermonuclear war, and at the end of playing itself in a game, it said, the only way to win is not to play. Well, so Whopper learned by playing a game. Uh, that's what just happened. You know, so we're actually there right now. So you start to think about it, you know, AI and games could change the world. But what if a traffic intersection uh, was a game that AI played with the goal of how to move the most traffic through most efficiently, uh, playing itself in a game of uh, traffic, <laughs> things like that. Um, but te technology has evolved uh, from being um, obedient and static and logic-based to more automated and dynamic and intuitive. Um, <laughs> I like to think that AI is becoming a lot less like data and a lot more like Kirk. <laughs> um, we're seeing a lot of progress. I think there's, um, uh, we're not quite there yet. Uh, you know, I think uh, this is a kind of a thing I like to show people. Like, this is actually a tweet I saw, and I'll just read it to you. It says, Dear Amazon, I bought a toilet seat because I needed one. Necessity, not desire. I do not collect them. I'm not a toilet seat addict. So no matter how tempting you email me, I'm not going to think, oh, go on then, just one more toilet seat, I'll treat myself. <laughs> it's, it's funny, but, you know, we still in, are at this place, and you've you seen it yourself. You know, I think for me personally, I bought a baseball bat for my kid one day, and uh, that bat, uh, you know, for two weeks, uh, Amazon was trying to sell me more bats. If the AI was learning and it understood what I was buying, it would understand that I bought a T-ball bat and that bat is going to be useless next year and they should sell me another bat and that bats are related to maybe I need a glove, maybe I need baseball socks and things like that. So it is getting better, um, but you know, you still see evidence of uh, uh, scripted AI. As we start to move from a world where um, we tell AI what to do to a world where you're asking AI to figure it out, um, we're going to see enormous change. Um, so these things together, you know, uh, what's binding them all together is AI. So AI is really an apex technology uh, that provides us it's an enormous power to change the world. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, and it's leading what's coming, what's happening right now, I won't say coming next, but it's really happening now, and that's convergence. You know, so when you think about uh, at the core, with AI at our core, what's next is convergence with other exponential technologies. So it's not just about the science of AI, it's about taking AI and converging that with other exponential technologies and, and increasing uh, our levels of abundance. So we're living really in overlapping revolutions. Um, historically, we had one revolution at a time, now we're living in an era, an era of overlapping revolutions. Uh, and these fundamental revolutionary innovations are driving new levels of automation. Uh, many are calling this the industrial revolution, fourth industrial revolution. Uh, and it's being powered by AI and AI-based automation. So let's look at a couple of things that can happen. Uh, genetics is an interesting area, right? So I'm um, sure everybody by now has heard of CRISPR. Uh, it's an open source gene editing software that allows us to become masters of our own DNA. Um, so we can now in real time, we can edit life. Um, with AI, we can now dramatically improve the accuracy of gene, of gene editing by creating predictive models of CRISPR behavior so they can learn and become more and more accurate. Um, so we'll become a world of uh, unrandom, maybe an un a world of unrandom selection. I don't know. I hope, I hope that's not the case. I think that another topic for another day is, is ethics and AI. Uh, it's just something we're going to have to really think about. You know, uh, uh, it's such a powerful technology when combined with other exponential technologies, we get almost these godlike powers uh, that are, uh, you know, uh, they warrant our consideration uh, for how we should govern uh, AI uh, around the world. Um, so there's a leading Chinese uh, CRISPR scientist. He has a farm with uh, CRISPR pigs. Uh, he has hundreds of CRISPR pigs. What they did is they actually uh, made them immune deficient. So we could, they made them more susceptible to disease so that uh, pigs and humans, because pigs and humans share uh, similar genomes. I think if uh, you're a lawyer, you have a lot of pig genes. <laughs> but, uh, but what works in pigs can be transferred to humans. So uh, it's very, very interesting what we're doing with CRISPR. And so it also shows us the possibility of eradicating disease. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so the convergence of CRISPR and AI is something that's shown us a pathway that uh, is very exciting. Uh, we can see the possibility of uh, complete eradication of pandemic diseases. Uh, we're being tested right now. Um, 
you know, this uh, coronavirus. Uh, it's, uh, it's, this has set uh, an agenda for the AI community. How can we be better prepared? How can we see, the, see a virus before it starts to spread? How can we stop it before it starts to spread? And it's actually some work my company is doing right now. Uh, we're actually involved in the COVID thing. We're working on a uh, chemical detection uh, that can actually determine, that can, uh, uh, can actually uh, detect COVID and other uh, infections just by breath. So I'm going, um, and so, you know, the idea of a global health network where as people kind of, you know, every once in a while stop at a kiosk and breathe in and make sure they're okay. Um, data is collected around the world to understand when there's new new things that were emerging, or if there's an outbreak happening, and we can stop it immediately. But those are all things. All those things are possible with AI. Um, another thing, just personally, I had, a, I had an employee whose wife had uh, breast cancer, you know, and um, her mother had breast cancer. Uh, her mother's mother had breast cancer. Um, you know, so this is kind of the slippery slope, right? If if you could remove that from their uh, their history. Uh, would you do it? I think we would all say yes, of course. But the question is, where do you stop, right? Um, I want my child to have stronger bones, bigger muscles, different colored eyes. You know, where do you stop? Um, so these are things we have to consider going forward. And then nanotechnology. Um, you know, we will have. It used to be that uh, it was who built Egypt, the big the, the the societies in the world that built the biggest structures were the most powerful societies. Well, it may be now that the the societies that can build the small structures will be the the next ones. We will have microscopic machines traveling through our body, repairing damaged cells uh, and actually actively wiping out diseases. Um, smart contacts, you know, you could uh, filter out just the right amount of optical radiation or, or you could maybe uh, you know, see a mile. Uh, molecular electronics, you know, um, I think you know, we're going to be uh, shortening the distance between things in ways we never could before. Uh, it's like anyone in, alive in 2050, you know, maybe it's not that soon, but I like to think that at some point people could choose to live as long as they want. Um, you know, organs could be replaced by super advanced machine versions that never aged or failed. And red blood cells are actually working on this now, building a synthetic blood, <laughs> like synthetic oil for power. We're actually working on synthetic blood um, for nanobot that can you know, power their own movement and eliminate the need for a heart. <laughs> so things like that. There's uh, amazing things happening today. Um, but, uh, you know, with uh, nanotechnology, again, it's uh, uh, maybe the next winners, the next people are the ones that can build the smallest structures, you know, building uh, nanostructures. Um, this is possible today, you know, that uh, the, if you had a uh, the verge, <laughs> uh, uh, you'd be 268 miles tall to give you kind of an example of the size of uh, or the scale of nanotechnology. Um, so um, robotics, I think we're also, we see this every day. I think uh, uh, Boston Dynamics, you've seen the, the videos there. Those guys are uh, doing incredible things. We're actually going to be working with those guys. But um, um, you know, I got that question you see on the upper left before. Um, the answer was no. <laughs> but um, you know, we're entering an interesting time. Um, so machine vision and sensing, conversational AI, contextual understanding, all these things are, are moving robotics. Uh, um, and much of this is being driven by Japan um, because they're, they have an aging society. Uh, I can't remember the stat, but it was something like uh, two out of every five or six people uh, by 2060 will be over 60 years. So um, they have a real problem. And so they're, uh, a lot of the, our best roboticists are, are going to Japan because they're putting a lot of money into how, how we build robots that can actually help uh, elderly population. Um, so, so this is a lot to kind of think about, but I, I you know, I think, uh, we as people, we have to change our mindset, you know, so before we can have these changes in the world, we have to think differently, you know? And so the first thing that we have to do is, is let go of fear. You know, I think, um, you know, you see headlines like this all the time, you know, uh, all the jobs that are going away and things like that. Um, I think, um, it's created a lot of fear of displacement, uh, fear of replacement, you know, and, uh, that's. Uh, not healthy. Um, and I do think we have a challenge because the change that's happening now will happen at an accelerated pace, a pace that we've never seen before. That's going to make things very, very difficult. But I do believe one thing's the same with this technology and this industrial revolution, and it's the same as the others, and that is technology will always create more jobs than it, uh, than it uh, eliminates. And I think that's especially true with AI uh, and these uh, emerging technologies. I think we'll have a lot more jobs. But even the the idea of a job is going to change. You know, the idea, I think in the 80s, we got to the 60-hour work week in the U.S. It was insane, right? Uh, and 80-hour work weeks. And uh, uh, it, with AI, the beautiful 
beautiful thing about this technology and about this evolution is that we won't have to work as hard. The grunt work, the small things, the tasks, the things that we spend all of our time doing could be automated by AI. Any process that takes you know, two or three seconds to do, you know, proving applications, things like that, could all be automated with AI. And so it leaves us time to be more human. Doctors can now spend more time with patients. You go see a doctor today, you may get three minutes with a doctor, maybe. What if you got half an hour with a doctor? You know, because everything else is being automated. You know, uh, so it changes uh, quite a bit. So we've got to let go of our fear. We have to embrace AI and the changes coming and even embrace the acceleration. Um, so I think uh, we continue to innovate with AI and, um, uh, and other exponential technologies. Uh, it will, it's not something we should fear. Um, it's something we should start to co-evolve with and be comfortable co-evolving with. So we empower the transformation, you know, by, by adopting an abundance mindset. Where AI is not something that we fear, but really embrace it. You know, so we, we look at AI as a co-collaborator, um, you know, almost like a, a friend, <laughs> if you will. Um, and I think that's where we have to kind of get our mind. We have to build a trust. And I, I have a whole other talk I do on the evolution of trust just what has to happen for us to start to trust technology so that we can move forward very, very quickly. Um, we have to change all sorts of things. Um, and um, so I think this uh, abundance mindset is important. It's time to we stop, stop building a world that's, you know, that we inherited from the past and start looking at a world that we could build that we borrow from the future with AI. And that involves a pretty big change in mindset. I think it's between a linear mindset and an abundance mindset. The linear mindset, you want to make something 10% 10 10 better. An abundance mindset is 10x or 100x through automation. The linear mindset, you wonder what's possible in AI. It's what color do you want? <laughs> you know, I think more and more if we go with AI, the question is not, uh, is it possible? It's what color do you want? Uh, it's, sure, it's possible. Um, in, a, in a linear mindset, you either succeed or you fail. In, a, in an abundance mindset, you recast failure as iteration. So when something doesn't work, you iterate and try again, iterate and try again, iterate and try again until you reach awesome. You know, and so it's a different, it's a different mindset. And that's actually alive in gaming today. You think about the culture, right? In gaming culture, uh, when I play games as a kid, you, you know, you, you, uh, you died, you died, or you lost a race, you lost. Um, gaming, you are always leveling up. You're learning what you did wrong and you do it again. You spawn a new person and you, and you, you, uh, you iterate and try again. And that's really the culture that we're, we're starting to move into. It's not that there is no failure anymore. It's just iteration. And then uh, in, a, in a linear mindset, you avoid risk. In an in a abundance mindset, risk is fuel. You know, there has to be risk. There has to be something that we're risking if we're moving forward. It's not something that we fear. It's something that we embrace. Linear mindset, steady progress is good. In an abundance mindset, steady is the kiss of death. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we have to be moving forward. Uh, and then instead of managing scarcity, we create abundance. And that's a, it's a, just a different mindset. We have to start all thinking, you know, in a, in a much more abundance, uh, an abundance type of mindset. Um, you know, as I, I talked to, so we think about jobs. This is a funny, it's a headline in New York Times. Uh, President ranks automation first as job challenge. He cites the burden of finding work for those displaced by machines. And this is a headline, uh, if you've seen it, uh, you're at least 58 years old. Uh, because it happened in 1962. Yeah, so this is actually President Kennedy. Uh, so are we doing, dealing with something different? No. Um, we've had machines for a long time. The difference is the pace of the acceleration and, uh, and the reason that's happening is the automation. The disruption of AI is not AI itself. The disruption is automation. Um, and we have to learn how to uh, deal with that and to, and to uh, uh, roll with it. <laughs> so uh, in terms of jobs, you know, do we want to do the same old shit or do we want to try crazy new shit? <laughs> so um, the way we do that is we embrace augmentation, you know, so um, with augmented intelligence, uh, I think uh, this is uh, the science of, of people radically evolving their, their, uh, their effectiveness, their interaction with AI. Um, even with technologies emerging like deep learning and auto ML, um, we're not at the point yet where machine learning can be deployed in completely unsupervised environments. Um, uh, as data volumes are increasing and multiply and the data itself is more complex, <laughs> it's more important that we uh, look for ways to augment our intelligence, to augment our abilities by working closer and closer uh, with machines. And, the, and we, we need to do that because we're limited by our biology. Um, you know, uh, we, can think at about 60 bits per second. 
you know, where an AI can think at a trillion bits a second. Um, we can, uh, we have about a 65% recall of information that we learn, and maybe it's 50% on a weekend. <laughs> the AI, there's 100% recall. You know, so there's reasons for us to want to engage more intimately with AI. It just makes sense. Um, so, as, and the concept of AI is now, uh, is it, it's not just limited to technology now. It's, it's, could it be biology? So here we are with Elon Musk talking about uh, uh, neuro. You know, he's over time, I think we'll see a closer biologists and digital intelligence. And it's, it's interesting, you know, because right now we all today are augmented cyborgs. I hate to say it, but everybody that has a phone, right? Do you remember phone numbers today? No, you rely on your phone. Uh, maps, you uh, kind of understand how to get there or do you just let the map take you there? So we're all augmented by AI today. What's happening though is the distance between us and that, and that AI is getting closer and closer and closer until Elon Musk wants to take a little piece of your skull out and a little button there uh, with uh, these uh, hair-like uh, fibers that, that go in your brain and, and can uh, cure and help you do things, do different things. So, um, so we're not there yet, um, but when we're waiting for this, this, these things to happen, uh, it's 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 a it's a great time to embrace it, uh, augmented augmented intelligence. Um, so if you look kind of forward, um, I think uh, AI will trigger our impulses. Um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be something that uh, will also anticipate our desires. Uh, and AI will eventually will know more about us than we know about ourselves. Um, you know, I think this is uh, probably one of the most interesting things about AI. We talk about the idea of autonomy, human autonomy, right? Our, 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 our ability to choose things. And, uh, one of the dangers I see kind of with AI is that, um, you know, as we get online, our online behavior, we're kind of being guided by AI. Like you're being guided on Facebook on who to friend and what to read and things like that. And so it has caused some problems. I mean, with the, all the problems you see in the world, especially in the U.S. around um, uh, the, you know, red and blue and left and right and all those things, they're actually being um, uh, accentuated and accelerated by AI. So now when you take on a certain mindset, um, you're being exposed to lots of other articles that are about that very same thing, and you're exposed to people who believe the same thing you do, and so it just accelerates that side, and the other side is the same way. You know, the AI is being used to accentuate what you already want to know and who you, who you want to know. And so we're almost creating this binary tribalism, if you will, and a lot of that's being caused by AI. So we have to pay more attention to that. You know, how can we create an AI that's more human-centered AI, um, an AI that we don't react to, but an AI that we act with. And um, I think we're, we're in this state because we put a bunch of engineers and built AI without any concern for sociology or uh, life sciences, things like that. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's put us in a very interesting place. Um, I think uh, um, in the end, our future and our ability to engage this machine is going to be critical to our evolution. Uh, and a AI is that apex technology that will transform literally every area of our lives, uh, governance, economy, security, biology. Uh, so it warrants our attention and our, um, uh, uh, well, <laughs> anyway, it warrants our attention uh, as a global uh, society. So, and that's really uh, my slide. So I've, uh, I think I came in around 38 minutes. That's not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, whoops, let's see. Let go back. So, if you have any questions, let me uh, slide back in. Uh, I think we can get a question uh, from here. That's uh, that's just excellent, uh, Dave. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, if you uh, stop your slide share, we'll uh, we'll sort of open up the video and so we can okay. see everyone that's on the on the feed. Um, that's amazing presentation. Uh, delighted as always, and I see uh, how. Um, how much uh, new information you've added in since I saw it the last time. So I found it as fascinating as, as possible. Uh, uh, there's lots of amazing questions. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion period. Uh, I'll take host privilege to, uh, to ask you the first question while, uh, while others are getting their questions in there. Uh, and I'm thinking about the comments you made around, around jobs and particularly my, our focus is on professional services as, as management consultants. And I was re reading research the, uh, the other day from quite renowned, respected uh, researchers who said that 27% of management consulting jobs would disappear uh, in mm -hmm. the next few years. And they sort of had the ranking of all the different professions. And my reading of that is more 
uh, that 27% of the tasks done by management consultants can be automated. But I'd, I'd be really interested in your perception on that because I think sometimes even researchers get a little bit overreactive in terms of, of the doomsday scenarios. Well, yeah, I think the, the you know, if I'm in management consulting, what I'm start, the questions I'm starting to ask myself are what types of new services can I build? You know, so we're operating in a world um, that is thirsting to understand what AI is and what uh, and uh, how to deal with it. Every company has this challenge, and uh, very few companies have mastered it. You know, so as consultants, we have to realize that um, a lot of the things that we've been talking about in the past, you know, are probably will probably have to change. We'll have to we'll have to alter our pitch, if you will. <laughs> you know, I think, um, but the way. Because you think about management consulting, what it's always been about is about um, pain points, right? So you walk into a company, understand the pain point, and help them understand how to get out of that pain point. Um, so over time, what's happening is the pain points are changing. You know, so a big pain point now is this ability uh, for companies to uh, to operate in an abundant world. How can I move faster? How can I operate more efficiently? and cheaper than I ever had before with the same amount of resources. You know, that's the question everybody's asking. How am I gonna survive in this world that's coming up? And so as consultants, we need to start to really think about the types of things that we're coaching people on and to read up and to learn about AI, learn about automation and to, and to uh, help people embrace the technologies uh, that'll take them to the next level. But I, 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 yeah, I don't think, uh, you know, I think it's a little dramatic to say we won't need consultants anymore. Uh, as I said, kind of in the middle of the presentation, um, AI doesn't understand cause and effect. It doesn't. We're not at a point now, and it's, it's overblown when you hear people say that, oh, in five years, AI is going to take over the world. Um, I'm a practitioner, and I, I, uh, um, I do believe we're going to see dramatic change in the world. But there are things that are going to take a long time, and we do not have the breakthroughs today that are going to enable to take us from these narrow AIs. And a narrow AI is an AI that can do one thing really well, you know, so it can find a lung tumor or it can uh, drive a car or the drive the car, the AI that drives a car can't find a lung tumor, <laughs> you know, but as people, we multitask on multiple things every day. AIs can't do that. All we have today are narrow AIs, narrow AIs that do one task really, really, really well. Um, so um, we're a long ways away from artificial general intelligence uh, where AIs can do all those things. A lot of those things, a single AI can do that. We don't even have the technology today to make that happen. Maybe we're a breakthrough or two away from that. So the possibility for consultants still exists to find those pain points, but to change your way of how you answer the questions, you know, so just become a voracious reader, you know, start to read about automation, start to read about the different types of AI and start to find the companies that are doing the things that are going to change the world. Call them up, you know, become work with them. You know, uh, uh, I think it's a, it's not a time when a management consultant is going to go away. It's been a time, but it is a time where it's going to change. Thank you. What was that term you used that we're years away from? Artificial general intelligence, did you say? Yeah, so you think about the evolution of AI, there is uh, artificial uh, narrow intelligence, where we are today, where AI can do one thing, uh, you know, uh, uh, Siri, is an, Siri is an AI, uh, Maps is a narrow AI. Um, the next level is artificial general intelligence, and that's this idea that where an AI can act a lot more like a person, where it can do lots of different things, not just one narrow thing. And then the final evolution they're kind of talking about is uh, artificial superintelligence, and that's where uh, an AI has exceeds human intelligence, right? Uh, that's on, on we hang on to our hats, right? <laughs> that's the uh, Terminator, yeah. <laughs> okay, I, know I have a, a lot of really good questions here, so I'll just okay. start from the top. So this one's from Otto, uh, who's based in Costa Rica. From your perspective, uh, what's the main challenge that advisors to C-level executives have, and what are the difficulties that you encounter when dealing with management consultants? Kind of a two-part question there. Yeah, I think um, you do, the, the good thing about working with C-level is that they're thinking at a strategic a level of strategy, right? And so you're not having to be in there and telling them how to do things. Um, you're telling them what they should be looking at and what they should, you know, and be considering. Um, because um, it's kind of what I said just a second ago, that if I'm an executive in a company right now, the questions that Gartner is asking me <laughs> is, uh, you know, will you incorporate AI in your business uh, to do these you know, number of things? And it, it's at a point now where you, the answer can't be, I'm not doing anything with AI. If you do that, you're not, you're, you're going to be, it's, it's the whole uh, water in a stream, right? Through the boulder of a stream, water will find its way around you. Um, there's an amazing 
um, motion. There's an amazing wave happening right now. You've got to surf it. You've got to be on it. So when I'm talking to uh, executives, you know, it's, it's more about the strategy of uh, building and growing. Like look at uh, oil and gas companies right now uh, and the challenges that they're facing. They have to change dramatically to, to get through this crisis. They have to change dramatically, but it's, it's not a, it's not a how question at the, at the, at the individual level. It's a how question at the executive level. What massive changes do we need to put in place now that will change our business and change the way that we operate? Um, but what changes do we need to put into place now? So I think that the, um, the, uh, when I speak to executives, it's, it's a, it's a, to me, it's a, it's a more fun conversation you know, because you're, you're, you're taking large pieces and saying, how are you going to solve this problem? Let me show you some things that other people are doing. Let's talk about automation. Look, at, look for areas of friction inside your business. Where is there friction that you could remove that friction in, through an automated process or AI-based automation? You know, so it's, it's conversations like that, not about how does the AI work and things like that. So I love the executive conversation because um, it can also be very impactful. If they adopt new practices, uh, it can literally change your business overnight. Um, when I work with consultants, uh, I think the thing I don't like is when they have the smarter than, smarter than you uh, thing. It's, I think I, when I look for someone I work with, I want them to do this with me, not for me. Do you know what I mean? Um, I want to work with someone that is smart, is informed about what's happening in the world and can help me understand which of those things I should try. And if I'm going to try something, what's the best way to do it? You know, and uh, that's what I want from a consultant. I don't want someone to come in and say, sit down and let me, let me tell you how the world's going to be. You know, that, that kind of stuff just uh, doesn't fly with me. And it's a very short conversation. I like someone that's smart and committed to work with me to figure things out. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, you're not alone in that. That's general feedback from clients globally. Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> Excellent. Um, this question is uh, asking you to go under the hood a little bit. It's from Adelwyn. Um, uh, AI systems are inherently built upon flawed data and human thinking, invisibly coded with our biases. What tools, legislation, or measures are being developed to safeguard AI against potential abuse, misuse, or the centralization of potential power of such systems? Yeah, this is a fantastic question. And unfortunately, there's not really good answers yet. Um, so I will say this, and uh, it was in about the middle of my presentation, we talked about how AI is changing itself. So um, one big change that we're going to see, and I think this has all come to, to light in the world when we start to look at the, the current thing that's happening with George Floyd, you know, and we look at our policing systems. Um, I was asked once to come in and help a, a, a uh, I won't say who they are, but the, a, a group to work, help them work on their AI and their policing system to help them understand where crime might be happening in a system, you know. And they were showing me um, their AI and how it was predicting where crime was going to happen in a city, you know. And um, when I started, um, uh, hey Dave, we have some feedback here. Could everyone keep their microphones closed, please? Yeah. Thank you. Um, but what I was going to say is that, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, when they showed me what they were doing and they were ex all excited about it, um, I, and they, the one thing they showed me was, here's the areas where you think the crime is going to happen. And, um, and then uh, uh, Dr. Desai, I think is a, uh, okay. Let's see. Um, but with the, with the uh, policing system, they had it, uh, and then they put officers in those areas where they thought crime was going to happen. And guess what? They found crime. And they said, isn't that great? And I looked at them with horror in my eyes and said, no, it's not great. You're basically giving a false positive. Anywhere you put police, they're going to find something happening. You know? <laughs> so um, this, you don't want to build policing systems on old data to the point of the person asking the question is, you know, if I build AI on what I know today, I'm going to accentuate what's already happening. You know, and I'm going to find crime where it's always happening. You know, and so we have to build systems that are less reliant, and this is going to sound crazy, but less reliant on historical data. So to train an AI, what if the AI, again, could play the game? Let's watch what's happening and uh, start to learn uh, uh, as things are happening. So going away from AI that you have to give it bevies of historical data, biased data, um, and getting towards an AI that learns from experience. And that's going to change things. Um, we're not there yet. We're in the midst of that now. But um, to the point of the, the person who asked the question, though, it is very dangerous. I mean, um, you know, uh, uh, we 
all data is bias. <laughs> I mean, everyone on this call, if we ask one question, would have a different perspective. We're all biased from our upbringing in some way. We're all biased. We just have to be honest about that. Data is no different. But the difference here is with AI, we're amplifying that bias. That bias can now be amplified and accelerated. So it's really important that we do with this issue. So I'm looking forward to a day when AI is learning more by experience and less on historical data or data that people who don't have the best intentions are loading it with. You know, they're loading bad data into a system and saying, oh, the AI said to do this. Well, no, the AI didn't tell what to do. Garbage in, garbage out. So we have to get to a point where AI, the learning is actually more automated. It's, it's learning by experience as opposed to learning from uh, historical data. Um, I will say one last thing on that too, though, is it's, um, um, you know, it's, uh, there will come a point where an AI will learn things uh, that are uncomfortable for us to recognize. <laughs> and I think that's a question that we're not gonna have to answer yet, but in the future, as an AI learns some things, it might actually learn some uncomfortable realities and we're gonna to have to be okay with that, you know? Um, so um, I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of things are being politicized right now. They're not happening for the right reason, they're happening for a political reason. And if you wanna to turn to data, data doesn't lie, you know, if, uh, if it's, so, so anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, this is a statement uh, from Christian in um, Brazil, asking whether it's right. Given the same computing data processing capacity, data storage capacity, software developing skills, uh, two competing AI systems won't reach the same results. This means that no matter what, AI systems rely on algorithms created by people. Is that right? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we have to, uh, it's like hiring a management consultant. I mean, if you hire two management consultants to take on the same thing, you'll get a different result. Um, AI is no different. Um, you're, uh, I like to kind of tell people that, um, you know, you're not, there is no truth, right? I mean, there's not a, if you're looking for an answer to something, um, there's probably not a predefined way that's the right way. There's, that probably doesn't exist. So all that exists is the possibility of how you get there. So choosing an AI. Uh, now, one way that we're handling that in AI is we're not using one algorithm. Um, we actually have, uh, in our company, we have a library of algorithms. And when we are given a problem, we put that uh, problem through multiple algorithms and we watch, we actually have built a system where you can put the algorithm through multiple algorithms, look at the results and choose the one that's pr producing the best result. Now, best result, is what you think the best result is. There is no best result. Best result is a judgment by the person who's the client, right? So uh, in essence, what you're trying to do is not to uh, buy into a master algorithm. I think we all kind of think of AI as like, it's a single algorithm, you know, and, and what's gonna change this, get us to supercomputing is a single algorithm. It's not the case. Um, there is multiple algorithms. And so, like I said before, we, we employ multiple algorithms automatically every time we're asked a question and we look for which one is getting the best result. And again, best result is what the client thinks the best result is. So um, I think you're right. Um, AI is no different from people. Uh, you have different algorithms that will produce different results. Um, but what you have to go into it with is what is the result you want? You know, uh, what is the expectation that you have? And um, how can we find the best answer for you and the best algorithms and, uh, uh, and the best AI for you to solve your problem? Um, I hate to leave it kind of messy like that, but it's, but it's true. There is no answer. There's no right way. The right way is what you say is the right way. The right answer is the one that you think is right. You know, so um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's usually AI solving problems that aren't binary. It's not like, is this car red or blue? You know, it's not like that. It's like, which is the best car for me? <laughs> so it's a more difficult problem, but uh, it's a great question. Yeah, AI is no different from people. Uh, they're, they're all very biased. <laughs> so you got to try lots of them. Yeah. Uh, I have a number of questions which kind of overlap, so okay. I think I've answered some, but this one from Andrea we haven't talked about yet. What are the secrets or specifics in managing high-tech AI businesses, startups, or companies that a business advisor should not forget to tackle? Mm, that's a great question. I have a whole talk I do on uh, business, on culture. Um, 
and uh, startup culture. And I think it's, uh, it's something that's changing today. I, I have a presentation I call Ex Entrepreneur, and it's a, basically an exponential entrepreneurship. And, it, and I talk about, and that's a presentation that we talk about what it takes to build a company today. You know, and um, I, so I think um, my short answer to that is that, you know, you, it's probably not a bad thing for you to start to look at culture and, and um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, you can put a great strategy in a company that has a shitty culture and it won't work. You know, you have to have a culture inside of a company that supports that company thriving and its employees thriving. Um, I actually, believe it or not, my major in college was anthropology. <laughs> and it was one of those moments where I think my mom uh, was very disappointed. I quit my business major and became an anthropology major with a business minor. But I did it because I was interested in corporate culture. And um, it's actually affected my whole life. Um, when we hire new employees, the first thing I do is I, I bring them in a room. Uh, when we get two or three new employees, I'll take them for lunch. And I bring lunch in, actually. And I have a little presentation I give on culture and what it means to work here and why it's different from anywhere else should be. Um, I talk about the idea of, um, you know, the top-down uh, directive culture is dying. Uh, that's not happening anymore. It doesn't work that way. Um, it's really a bottom-up um, movement inside corporations. So how can we empower people to, to help each other and to be, to be better together? There's two concepts I'll tell you about. So one of them is, that's a Swahili word I call it, it's Ubuntu. Um, uh, I call every culture I build an Ubuntu culture. And what Ubuntu means is, uh, it's, a, it's a Swahili word that roughly translated means, I am who I am because of who we are together. Um, in other words, when you come in my company, the first question I want to ask yourself is, who am I for other people? So don't, uh, I don't want you to, to focus on how do I leap over other people and uh, trample over other people. I want you to understand who's around you and who you are for them. How can you help everyone around you? And if everyone takes that on, you know, businesses grow dramatically. Um, and the second thing is co-elevation. It's this concept of co-elevation where it's, it's the idea of rising together, right? So we're gonna co-elevate together. So who can I be for you so that we can solve this problem together? You know, and so you're always asking yourself, who am I for other people? Who am I for other people? When you're talking with someone, when you're talking with the team, who am I for these people? And it's a different mindset, you know? So I think in the 80s and 90s, we got into this kind of like, a, you know, the financial companies and it's like, a, it's a eater, be, a killer be killed and that kind of stuff. And, that's all dying. You know, now it's more about how do I empower people? How do I empower people to be great? Who am I as a leader in the company for every person there? Um, you know, I, I'll give you a quick example. I had a, there's a girl in one of my companies um, and uh, she was just different, like something was wrong. And I knew it wasn't my business as, a, as her CEO to get into the personal business. But I just, so if I went up to her, I just, because I, I had to, you know, I asked myself, who am I for her right now? You know, and I said, well, who I am for her right now is just letting her know that's okay for her to, to be upset or whatever, whatever it is. And I'll support her. And, and if I can do if the company can do anything to help, let me know. And so I went and talked to her. I just said that I didn't get into the problem. I didn't care about the problem. I, I did, but I don't, it's not my business. Um, and man, you know, the, she opened up and uh, there were things that we could do. And we did it and things got incredibly great. And um, I remember when we, when we sold that company, I got this email from her uh, and she said, um, Thanks for being batshit crazy. <laughs> you know, and uh, she was just uh, kind of saying that um, nobody else does that. You know, no one else cares. You know, and so I think it's really important that we, we kind of recognize that companies are built by people. And um, we have to build systems and cultures inside of companies that support that thought. Like, how can, we, how can I as an executive uh, make, create an environment so that everyone is supported, so everyone can be successful? And how can people on teams support each other? And can I create rewards and in, in structures inside of a company that, that create that Ubuntu culture? So um, I think that's a big thing. It's actually, a, it could be a whole consulting thing on its own, uh, uh, teaching uh, new culture. You know? uh, I think it's better than strategy. <laughs> you know, it's a, it, when you have an organization with an incredible culture, uh, you now have a foundation to build on that's unlike anything, uh, and strategy will work. Uh, but if you start with strategy and uh, in regard of disregard of culture, uh, you'll fail. 
I, I um, thank you very much for that, Dave. That, and I appreciate that example at the back because when you gave the first two examples, many leaders interpret that as almost an abdication. You know, the company will, you know, it's it's uh, it's, it's abdication instead of empowerment. So the role of the leader is so important in terms of setting that context and having that vision and doing the leading the coal elevation, if you will. That's right, and, re and rewarding it. And also, I will say the other side of it, which is the uncomfortable side is understanding when someone is toxic. Um, you have companies where you'll hire someone and they end up becoming toxic to your culture. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a concept called a listening. And um, you'll know what I mean when I tell you, uh, like everybody has a listening. Uh, when you walk in, when a person walks into a room, something happens before they ever say a word. And you, you, we've all seen this, right? Somebody walks into a room and everybody goes, oh shit. <laughs> yeah. Or someone walks through a room and everybody lights up, you know? Before a person says a word, we have an expectation of who they are for us. And um, so some of this is actually um, understanding when there are people who are toxic to your culture, when they walk into a room and everybody goes, oh, shit, you know, they either have to leave or change. Uh, and I'm, I'm the first person to tell someone that. I'm very compassionate about it, though. I, I let someone go earlier this year for that reason. And I told him, I said, listen, but I think you're crazy talented. Um, and you'll be better somewhere else. It's just not here. Um, and I gave him a, a, he was only in the company for two months and I gave him a four month severance. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just uh, crazy. You know, I just want to support people. And I told him and, you know, just uh, let me know how I can help you, but it's, you know, it's not here. So. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. We're all already a minute over, but let me just give you this closing comment from uh, Michael, Michael Egan, who was uh, present with us in Dallas at IMC USA. Ironically, most biological processes are actually exponential functions, but we only have a base 10 heritage, 10 fingers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very true. I think uh, we give, uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm reminded all the time of how beautiful, you know, the, the human condition, the human mind, the human body is. I think we, you know, AI is, uh, is still very, very uh, uh, basic when we compare it to that. We're, we're an amazing uh, creation. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Excellent. I appreciate you letting me uh, come in today and I enjoyed speaking with you and I uh, hope to stay in touch. Thank you. Can I ask people to uh, turn on their video cameras for a quick uh, screen uh, screenshot so that we can uh, uh, document the moment? We've been doing this traditionally for our sessions. Um, any closing comments for us, Dave, uh, based on the questions that you've uh, heard today? <laughs> uh, just, uh, you know, I think uh, it's, a, it's an interesting time right now. You know, I think we, we all have to start to... Um, uh, think of this as a, as a moment where you don't want to live your life or, your, or, or structure your consultancy as a reaction to things. You know, um, it's easy to do that where we sit back and something happens, I do this, and something else happens, I do that. And, and you become a reacting observer to life and to your business. And I think right now we're at a point where you want to be the, the pebble in, in the pond. You want to be the thing that people are reacting to. So mm -hmm. don't hesitate to step out in the world and to put something out there and let other people react to you. <laughs> you know, so it's, uh, I think uh, we're unfortunately at a time where this, uh, when, we, when we wait, um, we get batted around a lot, and especially in time like this. So it's really important for you to become expert at something and to go out into the world and push it out there and ask questions and tickle the world and, and, uh, and, and watch how the world reacts to you, you know, and uh, take control of that. Wonderful. Thank you for uh, all this amazing content that you've uh, given us. I really appreciate that. Uh, probably tomorrow we'll be sending out the link to the YouTube video and uh, the PDF of the slides. I look forward to receiving those, uh, Dave. And uh, please do share this with, uh, with our colleagues. It's just uh, great information for us uh, to be able to have at our disposal. So thank you, Dave, for this excellent session. Hey, on hey, Michael. All my colleagues here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye.